um, I'll be talking about some science, and then I'll also be talking about some of the technology that uh, will help us accomplish that science and why the moon is such an extraordinary place for doing um, for doing science, not just for the moon itself, but for our entire solar system. Um, so yes, uh, I'm Wes Furman. I'm really happy to be here. Um, really happy to talk about the moon, which has presided over all of human history and been that sort of constant presence in our life, and also recording um, much of our history as well. Um, so there's this phrase that I often like to say that history rhymes, and we're in a very interesting place that has a bit of uh, a rhyme, maybe a slant rhyme, with uh, the first time we were heading to the moon. Um, we've just now had the Artemis One mission. Um, so that is, we're really going back to the moon now, and uh, we've been talking about it since we left, um, and it's really exciting to be a part of the extraordinary momentum about uh, going back and learning more from the moon. And this is, it's its a, about 50 years ago, uh, as of about six months ago, that we last uh, left the moon. Um, and so you can see here that that's uh, the last time we left was the Apollo 17 landing site. Um, there you see uh, Eugene Cernan, um, and uh, and you can see here, last year we had the Artemis uh, launch, the SLS rocket. Um, so 50 years later, we're actually going back. This is a human-rated uh, rocket. We didn't actually take humans on the first pass, but we, had, we did take a capsule further away from Earth than it has ever been. So this is the... the uh, Orion capsule that went uh, and did a little bit of a tour around the moon before it came home. And that is the furthest we've ever taken a spacecraft that could have supported humans. <laughs> um, and the next mission that we'll do will have humans on that uh, on that mission. Um, and most importantly, it, it returned back safely um, in December after doing uh, doing that round. And so, you know, we're on this precipice of a new era where we're going back to the moon. The actual last time that uh, we had a robotic lander uh, on the moon was in 1968. Um, and then we had crewed missions after that up until 72, so you know, 50 years ago. Um, and most excitingly, I think, is that there's now 13 more landers planned over the next three years. Um, some of those might get delayed, as they often do with space uh, that tends to work out that way. Um, but we also have one uh, crewed mission coming up, that's Artemis III, as well as lots of uh, orbital investigations, there's international exploration. Um, I don't know if you just saw uh, India just lands, uh, launched um, uh, a lunar lander just a few days ago, so it's in route uh, for one of those landings right now. Um, and so you can see that a lot of this is set was set in motion uh, a few years ago, about uh, seven, eight years ago, seven years ago. So when um, Space Policy Directive number one came out, um, and it said that we would lead an innovative and sustainable program of exploration, beginning with missions beyond low Earth orbit uh, to take humans back to the moon for exploration and utilization. And that's going to be our springboard for taking humans to Mars and other further de uh, destinations. Um, and quite importantly, even though we had an administration change, um, our lunar exploration, our space exploration is something that is remarkably bipartisan. And um, this is a quote now from our current vice president, uh, uh, Harris, Kamala Harris, who said, uh, the Artemis program will establish the first space station in lunar orbit and the first lunar base camp where astro astronauts will train for the first uh, mission to Mars. So the idea is that we can go to the Mar moon, perform extraordinary science, and learn how to do more investigations deeper and deeper into our um, into our solar system. So this is just an artist rendering of what Artemis base camp could look like. And that can be frustrating because we've been looking at artist renderings for some time now, 50 years or so. Um, but it's really exciting to see that these things are coming back. Um, and this is actually codified now in NASA's uh, official Moon to Mars program office that they have. They are understanding the moon lights the way for all of the space exploration that we're doing deeper and deeper. Um, and what's that going to look like when we have that station on uh, on the on the moon? Um, well, the analog that we have here on Earth is uh, McMurdo Station in, in Antarctica. That's where we do already long duration science and exploration. And if you can think about the extraordinary things that we've learned about the history of our planet from the science that we've conducted in Antarctica, we learn about um, 
not only the, the history of our atmosphere, atmosphere through the core measurements that we take, um, so our carbon history, um, we learned actually that's a place to go if you're into uh, collecting meteorites because you can see them against the um, against the uh, the white ice. You can see the little black flecks, and you can go out and pick them out. So it's actually where we learn a lot about science exploration. But it takes a lot to be there, right? So it's not just like the Apollo missions where you came in, did something, and came back. You do long duration science, and that allows you to learn. Uh, a far more deeper picture, richer picture of what has um, uh, what's transpired on on our Earth. And so you think about what's different now that's going to enable us to do this. Apollo cost like a percent, some percentage of the total GDP. We're not spending that amount of money on the Artemis mission, Artemis mission now um, or Moon to Mars. But we have an extraordinary amount of expertise in the broader space sector now. When when we first went to the moon, uh, we had each one of these little dots is like uh, 10 satellites on the left or on the right. So we had something like um, 100 and some satellites uh, uh, at that point, and now we're well over 5,000. And we're growing quite rapidly on that. So we have an extraordinarily mature ability to operate in space and launch things and so on. Um, so that allows us to move into this area where we're considering a sustainable exploration of space. So not just a one-off mission where we're flying and coming back and being done, um, and but doing this long-term, long-duration science and exploration. And so this, this is a definition, sustainable is often questioned, like what is sustainable exploration of the moon? Um, so this is a definition that comes from the National Academies of Sciences. So they do a decadal survey. Um, which basically sets the science priorities by trying to develop a consensus from all of those people doing the science uh, about what are the most important questions to answer over the next 10 years, which gives a lot of guidance to um, all of the things that we're trying to take on. Um, so their definition of sustainable, I think the most important thing about it is uh, we want to, we accept that there are widely, uh, there are widely accepted reasons to continue this lunar exploration and the continued investment, commitment, and risk beyond just a few of those missions. Um, and that's uh, to include the ongoing scientific discoveries, um, also investing in potential commercial development, uh, technology development, so we can go do more things, uh, educating uh, the next generation of STEM professionals and a scientifically literate public. And I think inspiring the public about our individual and collective opportunities and future. That's just a, a beautiful thing. I find the moon an amazing thing to work on because no one person can work on it. We can't get to the moon as a single person. And in fact, I think in the current era, it's it's probably maybe my, I'll take this, this is my personal opinion. I think it's even too much for just the United States to do it alone. So it really requires all of us. Um, and the moon is the one thing that anyone on Earth can see that we have the capability to reach. Um, and there's something that's really beautiful about that to me. Not everybody can reach it, but we can get there. Um, and actually, why it is such a fantastic place to learn about our own history is that, um, you know, not only does our human history rhyme, but planetary history also rhymes. So the same geologic processes that are happening now on Earth a lot of those have happened on the moon. Um, the same impactor flux, which has all the meteorites, the those things that have came through and hit our Earth over time and killed off the dinosaurs and all of that has also been impacting the moon. The water that was delivered to Earth and sustains our life, well, turns out that, that actually was on the moon at one time too, um, and that's going to play a pretty big role in what I'm what I'm talking about a little bit uh, in a little bit. So. Of all the amazing and interesting things uh, that we could learn on the moon, how do we select those? How do we get some guidance on those? Well, that's this decadal process that I was talking about. Um, and the latest one that came out was just uh, uh, last April, so just a year ago. And now it's it's set, uh, comes out a year in advance, and then it sets the priorities for the, the next 10 years. So starting now and until 2032, this is our guidance for um, uh, trying to answer collectively the most important science themes um, uh, that, that are pressing us right now. And the, the decadal survey that just came out is called Origins, Worlds, and Life. I mean, you might ask yourself, well, why are we, why are we looking to the moon for all of those things? But it turns out it is a fantastic record keeper for all of these things. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of the, the science arcs that came from that decadal survey, namely the solar system history and the water and volatiles process. Those will be the two major things that, uh, that I'll have time to talk to you about um, today. Uh, of course, there, there is a nearly infinite amount of things that we could be talking about on the moon, but I think that those two can tell a really, a really interesting story. Um, so first things first, we have to get our bearings on the moon because it's not the Earth. Um, so this is just a plot showing some of the, what I'll call a, a serendipitous geometry um, of the moon. So we all know that the, the moon orbits the earth and it's got a bit of an inclination. So it's tilted from the plane in which the earth is orbiting the sun. Um, and it's got an axial tilt as well, relative to that plane that it's orbiting uh, the earth. But the most important thing is that that axial tilt then relative to the sun is very, very narrow. Um, what does that mean? Okay, it's talked about a lot of stuff. What it really means is that the sun is almost always in the same position as it goes around the moon. Um, it's about a degree and a half off of um, uh, being always at that uh, uh, perpendicular position. So if you were standing on the lunar south pole, this is what you'd see. The moon or the earth, I'm sorry, would spin down low and dip below the horizon. And the sun would always be at this very, very low angle of uh, uh, coming in. So you would always have very, very long shadows. In fact, your shadow would be about 40 times longer than your height. So if you imagine, that's the kind of very stark picture that you're always getting. And there's there goes the sun, just swinging Y at that very, very low angle if we're sitting at the, the lunar south pole. Um, if you look over at the Earth, you can see that it's spinning, and that's actually upside down because we're standing in this uh, video on the lunar south pole itself. So this is the sort of experience that you would have, you know, sped up. This is um, each time the, the sun comes around will be a full 28 Earth days. Um, but you can see there's these very stark shadows and um, a low angle light. That's going to be your experience on the on the lunar south pole. Um, and here are the landing sites that we've kind of picked out. Um, this will be uh, one of these locations will likely be where we would uh, put our Artemis base camp, where we send our humans back for the first time and then begin the aggregation of assets that will turn into um, the actual lunar outpost where we'll be doing our long term uh, long duration science and exploration, like I was saying. So if you're looking at this picture, um, you can see the lunar south pole uh, indicated kind of in the center there. And then there's some big craters kind of sticking around. Um, these are going to be where we're kind of focusing our, our thoughts on. And those shadows are actually going to be quite important uh, later on in our story. So to zoom in on just that center crater right there, the one that's right next to the arrow uh, that's pointing out where the south pole is, um, this is called Shackleton Crater. And to give you an idea of the scale of Shackleton Crater, here it's uh, laid on top of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, so you see this is actually a huge, huge crater. And it's actually a tiny crater on the moon, but it's actually a really, really big uh, feature compared to what we experience on a sort of day-to-day -day <laughs> scale, right? Um, if you think about the depth of that crater, so I'm actually, my my first hometown was the Grand Canyon. So I always think of that when I'm thinking of a a geological feature that's particularly impressive. It's about 4,300 feet deep, almost a mile deep. Um, really an amazing place. If you look just at that crater that we we're looking at, Shackleton, uh, it's more than three times as deep as that, almost 14,000 feet deep. So it is just, a and if you look at it, it's so stark. It is really just a, a, a beautiful thing. You don't have, when you're looking around at these features on the moon, you don't have your normal cues for how far away something should be. You don't have the atmosphere, all of the air that's in the way that makes things look kind of fuzzy when they're way off in the distance. So your ability to estimate the scale of the features on the moon is completely different than uh, what your intuition would be um, if you were on the Earth. And so that that crater is actually just one of an awful lot of craters. Um, and in fact, this these preserved craters on the moon are what allow us to think about, you know, how we can investigate its history. On the Earth, all the things that make it a wonderful place to live, um, things like water and weather and plate tectonics and volcanoes and things like that, they're constantly erasing the history of the Earth. Um, whereas on the moon, 
those craters are preserved um, in, in permanence. The things that happen there can be preserved for billions of years, uh, which is really extraordinary, far beyond the time scale that we can think about. So if I, if I show just all of the craters that are mapped um, at five kilometers or larger, so these are pretty big craters already, um, you can see those those are all the ones that are outlined here um, here in orange. There's an awful lot of them. There's some some huge ones, uh, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a bit more detail, and they're just really all over the place. Um, if you compare that to uh, the the craters that we have on Earth, these on this is a, a set that we have mapped out here. This is all the known terrestrial impact craters. Uh, the largest of which uh, is about uh, 200 kilometers. Um, so the scale that they're shown on this little plot on the, the upper left is dramatically overestimated. They're actually pretty small compared to those ones that I was just showing on the moon. Um, and if you look at these, like the, the bottom right uh, crater right here, uh, this is a picture taken by my, my colleague here at APL, uh, Brett Denevi, who, by the way, is a phenomenal lunar scientist and uh, <laughs> I have to thank her for a lot of the story that goes along with this um, uh, with this talk here too. Uh, so this is a picture of a very well studied impact crater um, called Reese Crater um, in Nordlingen, Germany, and it's about 24 kil uh, kilometers in diameter, about 14 million years old. So in terms of craters, that's a brand new crater, and it looks like a field, right? <laughs> so life has happened, the, you know, the dynamics of the earth have happened and kind of smoothed over all of those aspects of the crater. Um, and now let's compare that to uh, a crater that's, you know, an order of magnitude older. So this is inside uh, Tycho Crater, uh, which is considerably larger than uh, Reese Crater, and it formed 110 million years ago. So um, you know, if if the dinosaurs were looking up at the time, they could have gotten a preview of their fate when this uh, when this impact occurred. Um, it would have been going about ten kilometers per second when it impacted the moon and caused an enormous flash. In fact, what we're staring at right here, this big this big mountain um, in the middle of uh, Tycho Crater, is what's called a, a rebound effect. So. You know, it's just like when you drop a, a drop of water into a glass, it drops in and then a bit of it comes back out. Uh, but this cooled so fast that it, as it came back out, it was stuck in place. So that's that's how well preserved um, the these events are on the moon, that even those very what we would perceive as a very quick thing, right? It's just the rebound. This happened um, or, over the scale of just uh, very quite quick, uh, very quickly. And these features are are huge. So if I zoom in again, this look, this is uh, you can kind of see it on this first one. The top, there's a little tiny rock that's sitting in the top of that little uh, rebound uh, uh, formation there. If you zoom in on it a little bit again, you can see there it is, just that little rock that's sitting up on top. That's about the size of a football field. Um, so this is really a, a huge feature as well. Um, you can see the stark, uh, the sizes of these things, uh, really dramatic shapes all across the surface of the moon. Um, so one of the main questions that we ask are, okay, we've got all of these impact craters. What's the size of them? How old they are? Um, and that's especially important because big craters were formed by big stuff that was hitting the moon. That same stuff would have been hitting the earth. And so we want to know about what was the what was the process by which planets formed and aggregated all of their materials out of the early solar system planetesimals. Um, so we look at the big um, the big craters to try to understand that. And um, one of the ones that will feature very prominently in, in this story is the Imbrium Basin. Um, so this is about a thousand kilometers in diameter, so an awful lot larger than anything that we've ever seen on Earth, um, or that we can find right now, I should say. And it was formed about 3.84, 3.8 billion years ago. Um, so that seems like an awful long time. Um, but I'll say that comparative to compared to the, the process by which we were aggregating all of those planetesimals, this is actually a very young crater. So 3.84 billion years ago is actually kind of young. Um, and how do we actually know the age of that? Well, we were able to pick up a sample, and this is sample 1405. You can kind of see it on the left here. This is a picture of it on the moon before it was collected and brought back and analyzed and all of that stuff uh, that we do. 
And that's how we were able to date this, uh, this piece of the ejecta from that imbrium uh, basin, from that impact. Um, and we dated it to this 3.8 or so billion years ago. Okay, so that's wonderful. We've actually picked out a whole bunch of other samples from around the moon. Uh, so this, each of these stars are one of the places where we've been able to collect uh, samples, had samples return. Uh, so you can see all of these really, really big impact basins. We've got Imbrium dated to about 3.8 uh, billion years ago. So the GA is just a unit that means billions of years ago. So whatever, it's just what they use. Um, there's uh, Serenatus, which is also 3.89, so about 3.8 billion years ago. Chrysium, also about the same age. Nectaris, also about the same age. All of these huge impact craters that seem to have formed very, very late in our uh, solar system's history for when we would expect these size of craters to be occurring. So this is just a notional diagram of what that looked like. So on the x-axis here is the age in billions of years, so starting with the early stuff on the left and then moving to the later stuff on the right, and this big peak that they have there, that is what would be inferred by all of these uh, very, very big craters that are dated at about 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago. Um, and what we call this, um, what we call this aggregation, this, you know, notional diagram is this, this stuff that happened at about 3.8, 3.9 uh, billion years ago, it's called the late heavy bombardment. Late because it was late in the history of our solar system, heavy bombardment because it's these giant, giant craters. Um, it's also called the lunar cataclysm sometimes because it was just such an enormous and dramatic um, scale to these events. Um, and, you know, so this was a big mystery for a long time. Uh, we didn't have a great explanation for why all of those late, um, uh, why all of these huge craters should have been happening uh, later on. Um, and so here's a, a dynamical model. We'll just let it cycle through and I'll try to do my best to explain it as we're, as we're watching it. Um, so this is just a simulation of how it could have happened. And there's several other models which are, are pretty similar. Uh, the idea is a planetary uh, migration. Um, and so if you'll watch, you can see on the, the innermost one that's pl plotted here, just plotting the really big, big planets. We've got Jupiter on the inside. And then we've got Saturn here, and it's at the start of this simulation, um, you will see that Neptune is actually really, really far inside. So the it starts off, yes, with blue inside of purple, so Neptune inside of uh, Uranus, um, and all of these icy planetesimals a little bit further out in our Kuiper belt. And what happens is there's a bit of a resonance, and what happens is the um, Neptune is sort of thrown out into that, um, that that distribution of those icy planetesimals, and that ex, um, and that uh, lunar explains the lunar cataclysm as part of a solar system wide late heavy bombardment. So those that um, the, that co those nearly coincident huge impact craters that were that uh, were inferred on the moon were a part of this solar system wide thing that knocked out all of these. Um, it was happening across uh, all of our all of our planets were being exposed to this. And so if you think about just how intense this would have been, these are much, much larger than Chicxulub, which was uh, what, uh, you know, it, ext the extinction event for the dinosaurs, right? So the scale of these impacts would have been would have vaporized the um, would have vaporized the water on Earth would have been life extincting events like across the board, um, and the amazing thing is that this was happening around the same time as life on Earth was forming. So this late heavy bombardment, you know, could have been reprocessing the life that had happened. Uh, certainly would have been intimately tied with that um, with those events that were happening at uh, the moments when life was being formed on Earth. Um, and then we would have gotten more of our water through some of the, uh, this is this, the idea for how the, the rest of the water would have come was this um, uh, veneer model, where we just kind of have things thrown on afterwards by things like comets, uh, some, some of the remainders of those icy planetesimals and so on. And that's, that's kind of the nice, neat, and tidy story of this peculiar anomaly that we inferred from our relatively sparse uh, experience going to these um, going to these different locations around these huge basins and getting samples from them. Uh, we've got our nice model. 
Nice model, sorry, um, and the water that came back, the lunar, uh, the late heavy bombardment lunar cataclysm. But the problem is that around 2000, uh, the late uh, 2000s and aughts, uh, we actually were able to put a, a much more advanced orbiter around the moon. So previous to the lunar reconnaissance orbiter and Clementine, some of these much more recent things, you know, for a very long period of time, the most detail that we had were essentially Polaroids that had been taken during orbits, right? Really not advanced uh, technology whatsoever. And one of the major things that we've learned having more orbiters around the moon um, is that the impacts uh, and ejecta get spread. Uh, it's, it's, it's a much different effect than we had originally anticipated and can be spread across an extraordinarily wide region of the moon when one of these big impacts forms. Um, and so one of the really important things to look at is there are different ways for us to try to understand the ages, the potential ages of, of the moon. And one of the things that we have noticed is that in those lunar meteorites that have been collected uh, on Earth, we don't see a dating spike around that period of the late heavy bombardment. So it seems like maybe we have been uh, thinking about this late heavy bombardment from the relatively few samples that we've collected and returned, um, but it's not as, as present in the other ways that we can uh, try to infer when the impacts would have been happening um, on the moon. And so what that means is that this idea of the late uh, heavy bombardment maybe isn't the, the actual story. Um, the, the cataclysm might not have happened. Instead, it could have been maybe a, a smooth decline, or maybe there could have been periodic events where things were coming through. That dynamical model, all of that effort to tell that nice and neat and tidy story isn't consistent with the data that we have now post-2009 you know, or 10 or so. Um, and so, okay, how do we actually go about solving this? Um, one of the things that we would have to do is go very, very far away from where those big craters would have been uh, that threw and contaminated everybody else's ejecta. Uh, we need to also do a lot deeper studies rather than just these few uh, little locations where we picked up samples. Uh, a much deeper statistical uh, uh, analysis of all of the samples that we could collect. All of that implies a much more extensive um, long-term science and exploration stuff. So one of the places we would go, um, shown on the left here, is just uh, this is a map of the thorium abundance, which we think is a good tracer for where the that um, ejecta, embryum ejecta would have gone. So we want to go very far away from the hot spots that are indicated on this map on the left. It doesn't actually matter that it's thorium. Um, so we just want to go very far away from that. And we want to go to a part of the moon that's as ancient as possible. Um, and the South Pole Aiken Basin, um, this is a great place to go. It's actually the largest, it's hard to sort of see the crater on this scale because it's so ancient, it's been reworked, there's more craters on top of it, there's craters on craters on craters here, uh, but this huge 2,500 kilometers in diameter crater uh, based around uh, the lunar south pole and extending up to this Aiken crater indicated on the top. That's a great place to go where you're far away from um, the uh, expected to be far away from that embrya, embryum ejecta. And you're at the lunar south pole. So that's that's one major reason why we want to go. We need to sort out what was the impact flux on the moon so that we can know what was happening on Earth as well during this period where life itself was starting to uh, emerge. It's a really critical question. And now the other aspect about the south, mole is, moon, uh, south pole is going to come into play as well. So you can't quite see it on this plot up here, um, but I'll show you a few more in just a second. This this serendipitous geometry, um, what it means that that the, the that angle of the sun being almost at the perpendicular to the moon at all times means that we have deep, deep craters. Those deep craters that I showed early on have been in the dark for billions of years. So they've not been they've been cold and dark and sort of the ultimate preserving location. <laughs> Um, within our solar system. Um, so, you know, on this uh, around the equator of the moon, you've got the normal uh, day night cycle, which is our 14 day cycle, full cycle of the moon, about 28 three quarters days, but each each side gets about 14 days. But if you go to the bottom, that's in the dark for billions and billions of years. 
Um, this is a, a plot. This is our, our friend Shackleton Crater that's about the size of Washington, D.C. Um, this is the average solar visibility. So this is how much sun you would see um, if you were standing on the spot and just counting up over time. Uh, in the in the depths of these craters, you would see you would never ever see the sun. In fact, some of these we call them permanently shadowed regions, maybe for obvious reasons. Uh, some of them are colder than the surface of Pluto, right? So this is an extraordinarily cold place. We're talking, you know, on order down to 20 degrees Kelvin, 20 30 degrees Kelvin. So that's 250 degrees below zero in, in Celsius. <laughs> um, so really extraordinarily cold places, um, and they've been that cold, stable place for uh, quite a long period of time. And uh, here's a map, uh, a little video that'll show as the sunlight sweeps over this um, terrain, you'll see places that are turning red periodically. That's where they're in the sun and getting illuminated and starting to get hot. And you'll see some of these features that just never never uh, go away from that dark purple color. Those are the cold spots, the permanently shadowed regions. Um, and for our reference, again, this this one at the bottom here, that's our Shackleton crater. Um, that's that's like Washington, DC, uh, right down here. Um, so I don't know, maybe one of the other ones is Baltimore or something, I don't know. But what you'll see is that as soon as you move off, uh, as soon as the sun moves off, you get very, very cold. Um, but as soon as the sun arrives, you get very, very warm. Uh, but these places deep within the crater where it's been permanently dark for billions of years, it actually stays cold enough even during the, the summer months um, that if there are any frozen volatiles, meaning water or other, um, other volatiles, uh, ammonia and so on, uh, but really water is the one that we're thinking about, uh, they would stay stuck there frozen um, in perpetuity. Um, so we can actually go and look for these, um, for this water. Um, one of the ways to do it is with something called neutron scattering. Uh, so I actually did my PhD in neutron scattering in a bit of a diff different context, but um, my PhD advisor, uh, he loved to tell me the phrase, neutrons don't lie. They are a fantastic probe. They will tell you what is actually there. Um, and one of the amazing things is that they tell us that uh, water is there. Um, the way they do that is that they interact with the hydrogen that's in the water. And so when they jump back up, uh, we'll get a little signal uh, that shows us that uh, those neutrons have interacted with uh, the hydrogen there. So we can even use the cosmic rays to generate uh, neutrons, which should interact with those waters, uh, with, with water or the hydrogen on the water, and then be able to measure those uh, on the end. And so we can tell from the, the, the sort of nature of those neutrons that we detect uh, that there has been water there. Um, this is a map of the neutron count ray. This is a new orbiter that's going up there. This is the Korean orbiter. Um, there's also going to be able to do uh, other optical measurements of these fantastically interesting dark, dark places. Um, and so we can also learn about the history of the water that arrived there. And this is going to take an awful lot longer than even just the uh, dating the the uh, eject the samples and the rocks themselves. You have to do even more detailed uh, studies of the water that you would find. Um, here I'm showing a, a plot that just gives uh, a ratio of the deuterium and hydrogen that's in the water. So it's a pretty complicated thing, uh, but there are different uh, signatures within the water itself, which can tell you its history as well. That's all you really need to know uh, from all of that. Uh, but like I said, this is going to take an extremely long period of time because you can't just go to one of these places uh, and you can't just sample one of the little places where you might find water. You might find little pieces of water, kind of just like frost on the surface there, um, that are just sort of stuck to the grains of the lunar dirt, which is what we, we actually call it regolith. Um, you might find it stuck in there. It might be actually trapped in some of the other locations where it would be uh, accumulating. It could be in patchy ones or even, you know, discrete large chunks deeper down in the um into the uh, uh, into the um, beneath the regolith, and what we'd really like to do is be able to collect those samples, um, package them up in such a way that they would stay cold and um, uncontaminated in route coming all the way back to Earth, so we can do not just sample returns but really investigate that water uh, in depth, and that's going to take an awful lot of work, um, but. Again, this is the most important thing for us to understand um, for over the next 10 years. We really want to understand 
the origin of our solar system, the, the history that we had uh, arriving where we are. What is the nature of those, uh, of that water and the volatiles? These are the, the key questions that we have in planetary science. And so we need that long duration science and exploration station. Um, and there are a few things that make the South Pole good for setting up uh, a research station like this. So I talked about the areas of near uh, of permanent darkness. Now, one of the amazing things, I think this is just sort of a beautiful thing too, that immediately adjacent to those regions where it's extremely cold and extremely dark are regions where it stays light almost permanently. Um, so some, some people call these things, um, yeah, it, it's not actually a permanent, uh, il permanently illuminated, but I, I consider them sort of like islands of habitation where we could put our, you know, our base and have a good amount of um, you know, the, the temperature would be moderated because we've got an, uh, we've, where we'll be in the sun. We'll have power because we'll have the sun. Uh, so these are the places that are immediately uh, next to the uh, next to those deep dark places that we want to explore, raised up along the ridges. These are regions of extended illumination where we could go, put our base camp, and be able to study these fantastic questions about uh, um, the, the volatiles that could be bound up in these regions, as well as go out on excursions more uh, in more depth to understand the, the general impact flux in this South Pole Aiken Basin where that's extra, exceptionally ancient and old. So we can answer both of those questions at once. We've got the fantastic um, coincidence of the dark and light being right next to each other and allowing us to actually do this. Um, and this is just a picture of what some of those solar arrays look like. So instead of, you know, like on your roof where they're just kind of sticking flat to point at the sun, because the sun is always coming at you from this direction, these are vertical solar arrays. So that's how they set them up uh, so that we can go and do that. And several companies are developing these solar arrays right now uh, intended uh, to go to the moon. And that's just, just a few of them there. Um, of course, it does still get dark in some of these locations. We're also getting fission surface power, which I don't know if you all know, McMurdo Station also had a nuclear plant at one point. Um, so this is how you can get power during those periods uh, when you're extremely cold and extremely dark uh, as well. Um, you can break apart the regolith and do some, create some of the things that you need out of the moon itself. So you can build, sort of bootstrap that base that you want to make. Uh, here's sort of a picture of how you would collect that uh, regolith, uh, put it into a conveyor belt that would load it into um, a reactor that would turn the regolith into oxygen and metal. It's amazing fact that the moon is about 40% oxygen wherever you land, bound up in the oxides and silicates. Um, those of you who are into to geology might, might understand a fair bit of that already. Um, and you can use that to build the base that you've got. And one of the amazing things is that people are thinking about how you would use this water in whichever way it might be bound up. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, try to collect it and put it together, depending on uh, which, form it, um, which form it was in. And once you've got that water, you can drink it. You can split it into oxygen and hydrogen. Um, this is just a picture, you know, it's kind of neat that there's that, you can see an example in water of that rebound that I was talking about earlier. Uh, but one of the, one of the most amazing things I think is that once you've split, uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen, you can actually go the other direction too. And in fact, one of the ways that we get up to the moon in the first place is by combining that hydrogen and oxygen. That's rocket fuel, that, that, Artemis rocket, the SLS rocket, um, that works by combining hydrogen and oxygen. So you can actually get your rocket fuel that can enable you to sustain life. It can also enable to you to return back to Earth. It can enable you to go further and do more exploration out into um, deeper into the solar system. Um, and so that's that's kind of a view of the future and a view of um, sort of how we can get to the point where we'll do those fantastic studies of uh, the science that uh, defines ourselves as well as the rest of, of the solar system. Um, and just to kind of, we got a few minutes left, so I actually timed this, this okay. Um, so this was the last statement that we said uh, as we were leaving the moon 50 years ago. Um, America's challenge of today, I like this line, America's challenge of today has for, has forged our destiny of tomorrow. And that's that's really an amazing thing, right? 
what we're doing now really does shape our future. And the moon is a fantastic place for us to learn about where we came from, where we are now, and think about where we want to go uh, in the future and also be looking back at our fantastic earth and all that it has uh, to offer us. So I'm hoping now that the audio will come through. So this is um, a little video that was put together from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which really kicked off our modern era of exploration and science of the moon. Um, and we've got Debussy, uh, Debussy's uh, Claire de Lune, which is my favorite of the moon songs. I wonder if I can, can you see, hear the audio now? Not quite? Okay, give me just one second. I'm going to try to change the audio here. I think there's a share audio option. That's what I'm looking for right now. We can just enjoy the video. So 
Deva. Wonderful way to close out. That was beautiful. Yeah, it's great to not have to talk at the end and just let this beautiful, serene thing be what it is. Let the moon, uh, let the moon uh, uh, speak for itself. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. It's time for questions and uh, and hopefully some answers. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, if you want to raise your hand, you can do that. I'll call on you. You can put a question in the chat box. Uh, Alan, go ahead. Hi, thank you. That was just wonderful way to end too. Um, and I don't know if I missed this because I was getting food at one portion, but I want to go all the way back because I'm not sure I heard like sure. how the moon was born, where that came from. Oh, right. That right. little thing. Right, that little thing, right? So, you know, it, it's sort of funny because if we think about all of the impacts that the moon has recorded and all of the little chunks and things that have happened to it, that's the one that's been erased the most. Uh, but, you know, right now, the the predominant uh, explanation is that it was born from a huge impact uh, with the earth. So we are born out of the same stuff, which is really why it is our, our partner in space, right? We are, we are the same thing in this beautiful sort of contrast. We get all the life and the moon gets all of the history. So. Yeah. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Can you go over again? I mean, you talked about the, how the water is uh, hooked yeah. up uh, to, uh, to the to the particles uh, yeah. on the soil. I don't know if you call it soil up there or not. Megalith is what we call it, but it's, I mean, it's little, the tiny little pieces that form, right? So the moon is so stable. It's just the tiny little pieces that form when there are ejecta. So immediately frozen out. They're incredibly sharp and granular and just really nasty things actually. But the ice, yes, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's our vocabulary word for today. Um, is you mentioned the earth getting its water from the moon or from other asteroids. Could you right. talk about that just a second? Right. So actually as part of the um as part of the, the story that goes along with the idea of the late heavy bombardment, there was this idea that all of these other icy planetesimals, they call them, that were kind of floating around, uh, were delivering water to the Earth and to the moon. Um, so, but the issue is that, you know, if you would, um, you know, whether that happened before or after or during this late heavy bombardment, that's still an open question because we don't really know a lot about how that actually worked out, right? So we've just in the past decade really come to the realization that this idea of the late heavy bombardment might not be the right story. <laughs> um, so that that's kind of an open question. I think it's a pretty important one for us to be asking. Um, yeah, so so that's where that that kind of stands. I'll say that you know, even the water that's on the moon has been worked and reworked. It's captured in these you know cold traps, those permanently shadowed regions. So it gets stuck there, but they're shadowed from the sun. But they won't be shadowed for, shadowed from other uh, meteorite impacts and things like that. So they get kind of worked over, and it'll take it'll take an awful lot for us to be able to pick out the pieces that maybe are the oldest and tell the story of the water, when it could have arrived, um, how long it's been there, you know, what, and that's generally what we would infer is that the same thing would have been happening on Earth as well. And so the goal is to test the water particles that you find on, uh, uh, find on the moon versus the ones here to see which ones are the same and Etc. Yeah, so so we can generally know um, when there's a big major impact, um, it sort of resets the geological clock for the material that's there. Um, a lot of it's uh, the the exposure to cosmic rays. Um, it it's sh it's sheltered if you're down deep in the uh, underneath all of the regolith. If you're sheltered from all of that, then you don't have as much interaction with that. 
Uh, but once you're exposed back up to the surface, you start counting up how long you've been exposed to that cosmic radiation. Uh, so that's kind of the clock that gets ticked on that. Um, so as you work your way through, you can see how long things have been sheltered, where there might be um, other things like the, the isotopic distribution is basically that's how you date everything that we have. Um, and you do the same thing in slightly more complicated ways, depending on whether you have water and where it's been and all of that sort of thing. So it's uh, like, Ralph, we don't have carbon there, so yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, Ralph asked, could there be life if there's water? That's right. So the water on the moon is in these locations that are exceptionally cold. Um, we're talking like quantum mechanics level of cold, you know, on the orders of 20 degrees Kelvin. So to our knowledge, there is no life that can survive to those temperatures. Um, so I would say most likely not. Um, but also the fact that it is so frozen in place will mean that, you know, we can have a record of it when it arrived and whatever was happening to it, we'll understand. And that was, you know, around hopefully the same time when life was emerging here. So it's like the sterile version of what happened here. Always with, you know, with a history, you'd love to have a perfectly preserved sterile thing so you don't have to try to figure out what was what. We are looking Alan, for other places in the solar system though. <laughs> so I remembered my other question, which is the, the space travel geek in me. I <laughs> noticed early on when you showed the Artemis and the capsule returning, it's pretty similar form to the Apollo. And I'm wondering, did we just get, we got it right the first time as far as the optimal shape or, yeah. or is it just the most cost-effective, efficient, safe? Oh, that's such a, that's a great question, actually. Um, so re-entry is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and the, the way that you survive through that is, um, yeah, you have a, a, an optimal shape. Um, and it turns out that we kind of know knew how to do that right the first time. Um, it's sort of an interesting, um, you know, I don't know if you ever noticed, but this is this, you know, we understand how to move through the air and we had to how to do re-entry. We got that right the first time. Um, one thing that struck me when I was learning about that the first time was that, you know, how we move through the air is very limited by the properties of the air. So for instance, why don't airplanes go an awful lot faster now than they did, you know, in the 60s? Well, it turns out, they always want to fly less than the, the speed of sound, right? So that's kind of their speed limit. Um, in the same way, we want to make sure that the shape is, you know, it's optimized for what those conditions. So it's really conditions of reentry haven't changed. And we generally knew the things that you want to avoid. Generally, you avoid sharp things because at sharp things, when you have a shock front, they get exceptionally hot. Um, so if you try to have something sharp reenter, which seems like counterintuitive, right? You, I, you would love to be able to cut through um, cut through the air, right? That would seem like it'd be the great thing to do. But then you're putting all of this immense heat onto a very tiny location and it would heat up in a blade and just burn away right away. So the physics of that hasn't changed. And so the general shape of the capsule hasn't changed. Thanks. I mean, it made me think about the shuttle, of course, too, which, yeah. you know, must have had huge dynamics up against yeah. it. Oh my gosh, yeah, and, and it's it's really interesting. All of the stuff that we learned about, uh, yet you know, one of the problems that I studied early, early on was um, something called shuttle glow, which is basically when the shuttle was passing through a very dilute part of our atmosphere, you could see a little bit of glowing off of it, and it was just the recombination of uh, the molecules that it was knocking apart as it was creating this, you know, uh, this shock wave <laughs> through the atmosphere. So it's pretty neat. Uh, Ralph asked, if, is, do you drill to the center of the moon? Would it be rock all the way through? That's also a fantastic question. So um, the, the one thing that I didn't talk about um, today that is that is a priority for the next 10 years in that same planetary decadal uh, was understanding the geological processes. And some of them are still active on the moon. There are, there are moon quakes. <laughs> Um, yeah, no chocolate nougat, I don't think, but there are, are moon quakes that are happening that may indicate that there's still some activity way down deep in the core, uh, but it's not a lot, right? So it, it would probably get squishy at least and maybe pretty liquidy down in the center, but not at all like what we have on Earth where we're, you know, basically just floating on top of this huge molten core. It's not like that. It's pretty, uh, pretty solid. 
right? Now, if you took all of the, the water and hair off of the Earth, would it look like the moon? Would it show, would it show the craters that have impacted it or have they eroded down because of weathering? Yeah, so they are all eroded. They, you would not see them. Um, they've, and it's not just the weathering too. That is absolutely a, a big part of it, especially the ones that are, you know, um, in areas that are less tectonically active. Um, but a lot of it is just the, the, the crust is being reprocessed too over the four billions year of years since the moon had cooled and started to collect its craters. Um, so, but if you took, even if you took all of the, the water and air away from Earth, it would take quite a long time for those geologic processes to, to slow down enough where they would start collecting all of that stuff, all of those pockmarks and things. No chocolate nougat. The technology <laughs> that you, you, you mentioned um, where they would take uh, I guess you're taking the water and splitting yeah. it and using the hydrogen and all that stuff on the on the on the moon. Is that is that tested? Is that available now? Are they doing that now? Yeah, so we do all of uh, almost all of these processes we do terrestrially in some form. Um, in fact, one of the one of the folks who I know who's working on a slightly less dramatic version, you don't have to, you can combine hydrogen and oxygen um, in something called a fuel cell. So, for instance, Toyota has a car that will run on that green combination of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, I think it was their Muri. Um, so they do it that way. Uh, the, the process of splitting them apart is called electrolysis. And that's one way that you can generate oxygen. Uh, for instance, the when there was a shortage on oxygen during the COVID uh, pandemic, um, they, they were looking into ways that you could produce oxygen using the, um, some of the technology that NASA had developed for um, their life support systems, which would recirculate and break this apart and do all of that. So, yeah, it, it's very much tested. Actually, one of the really interesting ones is, so you can split things apart with electrolysis. You can do it with water. Um, you can actually do it with that molten regolith too. Um, so if you had lava and you did the same process of splitting it into oxygen and calcium and aluminum, you can have that same process split apart and get that oxygen out. And actually that's what we do terrestrially to produce steel without any extra carbon. So that's how we can process iron oxide into iron. Um, so that's how you can turn rust back into steel. Um, that's the same sort of technology that we're looking at. And there are people who are doing that. I was just wondering if there was ways to to incorporate that into carbon capture for uh, for for climate change. Oh, that's an interesting idea. I haven't really actually thought of that. Um, the general idea is to produce less carbon with that method because every bit of energy is going into just splitting apart the iron and the oxygen. Um, but yeah, there there. I mean, that carbon oxygen bond is a really strong one. So you can find ways to use that. That's a good one. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Richard asks, is radiation a problem on the moon and how long can you stay without damage? Plus, he also asks, does the Earth's magnetic field protect the moon too? These are both fantastic questions. Um, so radiation is a huge problem on the moon. And in fact, it's more of a problem now than it was during Apollo. Because one thing that we've done since then is we've developed these fantastically tiny little energy, very small energy efficient computers, those are much more susceptible to radiation effects than these big, clunky, old things. Um, so that's it's actually a huge problem. Um, so how long you can stay without damage depends on if you the sorts of structures that you would build. Right now, the general targets that we're thinking for, like what the life cycle for some of these elements would be, is about 10 years. Um, now, they could be an awful lot longer than that. And, and if you all know NASA, you know that they often will design for a life cycle and then beat it by 100 times that, right? So <laughs> we're, we're targeting 10 years of life for a lot of the, uh, the, the elements that we're trying to put together. But I would imagine that some of them are going to go an awful lot longer than that. Now, the other question about this, the Earth's magnetic field protecting the moon, well, what I, it's a little bit smaller than it would be able to protect it. And it's actually Earth's magnetic field is swept by what's called the solar wind, right? So there's all sorts of radiation that's coming off the sun that is 
sort of shaping this magnetic field into a tail uh, away from the sun. If you imagine there's like, it's sort of like a comet almost, but you can't see it because it's like the radiation fields, right? So every time the moon goes around the earth, it passes through what's called the earth's magneto tail. Um, and that's the, the the tail that's swept out from the earth. So it's actually more of a problem than a protection because as it goes into and out of that magnetic field, there are these phenomenal um, uh, fluctuations in the plasma field and the electric field, because that rough edge of the magnetic field is being shaped constantly by the solar wind that's pushing out on, on, it, on it. So that's a really interesting question. I, I love thinking about that. And that can actually impact if you had a big, long power system that you'd want to do to transfer power along all these different elements, that's suddenly sub susceptible to these rapidly fluctuating fields. So that's that's a great question. Ralph asks, how are they going to collect the samples down 13,000 feet where it's so cold? You're, you, how are they going to do that? And our mission is going down. Yeah, so that, that's also a fantastic question. Um, so I, humans down in those permanently shadowed regions, it's so cold down there. I really don't think we'll ever send humans down there. And, and when stuff gets that cold, everything breaks. So there's something called differential thermal expansion, which means some materials will shrink faster than others. And even just trying to get something into that cold location will break apart most of the technologies that we would want to put down there. Um, so we are absolutely intending to send some rovers down into these permanently shadowed regions. I don't think we have any plan to go down into Shackleton Crater, that really deep one, but there are some other shallow ones around that we can that we think we can send some rovers down into. Um, now, the trick is if they're battery powered, those batteries won't last long when they get cold. You all have tried to start your car in the winter. You know, it's a big pain in the butt. Imagine that, but like orders of magnitude worse. Um, and also they'll just run out because they won't have any way to recharge if they're in this permanently dark location. Uh, so the other way to get down in there is with uh, um, a radioisotope generator. Um, so it's it's not quite a nuclear power plant, but it's something that stays hot permanently because it's radioactive. Um, and so you can use that heat to generate electricity and power your rover and keep things sort of a little bit safer and warmer as you go out and rove around on things. And that's actually how we do it on Mars too. It's something called an RTG, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. It turns the heat into electricity without any moving parts. Uh, really, really amazing technology actually. Um, so that that's how we're gonna be able to get there. There's other ways too, you might be able to get power one of those rovers from the, the crater rim. Remember that's all in that illuminated region and then point a laser at your rover. <laughs> this is power beaming. Um, so, you know, right now, all of our power comes from the sun. It is beamed across space from the sun to us. Um, the same sort of idea, but you could do it in miniature with a laser. Instead, you point a laser at what is essentially a solar panel, and you can get power without any physical connection in between them. So you could send a rover out with a little, you know, high-powered laser pointing at that rover to go out and do things and still power it, even though it doesn't have any actual sunlight in there, too. So those are some of the ways that we've thought about going into the into the permanently shadowed regions. You could do it with a tether, a big, long extension cable, but those get pretty tricky too when they're exceptionally cold and frozen and sharp around pointy things, so. I love the creativity. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to just, it, figure these things out. Sean ta is asking about China. Yeah. Who's gonna colonize the area of the moon first? Or are we gonna finally figure out how to work together? That's a, that's a great question. I, we were talking about this at the beginning of the hour. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do that I think that we'll, we've actually been endorsed by you know the executive branch to start trying to figure out how we can have something called an international lunar year. Um, so it, you all might be familiar with something called the International Geophysical Year. So this happened in 1957, where there was exceptional tensions around the world. Um, and we were all going to try to, there were lots of things that were happening. We were able to send satellites out to start taking pictures. We were starting to see how that could happen. Um, we were starting to want to lay claim to Antarctica, for instance, for you know, whatever reasons we wanted to do that. So it actually has a bit of a, a, um, a similarity to the moment that we're in now. Uh, but 
we had this idea to do a year where we would do everything to form the right collaborations and you know come up with a, a treaty the antarctic treaty we came up with during that time so there was di science diplomacy there was actual you know policy that came out of this and it was that's how we came up with the antarctic treaty which allows us to work together um for science and exploration in Ant antarctica so that absolutely can happen uh so right now and that was you know there was phenomenal collaboration between the united states and, and the ussr at the time um, and that's what we're kind of looking at doing with the International Lunar Year. Um, so one of the things that I've heard, I'm not sure if it's true, because no one can ever be sure that it's true, uh, but there are some people who will say that the amount of money that we saved from the space program, from the Apollo program, um, f we actually saved an extraordinary amount. It was incredibly expensive, measured in several percentages of our GDP. But we brought along so much affinity worldwide that it prevented likely quite a few conflicts because it was it was a unifying thing we could we could show that we were not only powerful but we were doing something that we um that we were coming together for so yeah that, that affinity building is something really important too as i was saying before like it's shocking that in this time of hyper partisanship you know the moon and our, our efforts to go back and explore and do the science on the moon didn't really change between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, which, I mean, they didn't kill the Artemis program, for instance, when it switched over. It, it's, it, it has its ties back across that, which is just, that's extraordinary to me. So we need to lean into those things that bring us together. Um, that's sort of my own, my own personal take on that. So who will get there first? I don't know. I, I think that it's it's important for us to ask these questions because if we don't ask the questions, then we don't come up with the answers. Absolutely. Alan, you have your hand up. I'll ask one, I think. Yeah. Uh, here's the amateur astronomer in me. Dude. Mike, there, since, since people are there, going to be there, let's say, for longer periods of time, might there be anything to learn during what would be lunar eclipses? You know, might there be something there? And I'm going to post a photo in there that I took that apologies about the focus. <laughs> oh, no, please. I'd be happy to see it. Um, so what we could learn during those periods of time, we do generally try to um, use those moments of like serendipity to do measurements, right? So during eclipses was how we sort of first proved that Einstein's theory of relativity and like the bending of light um, as it passed around a massive object. That was something that we learned at that time. And I love how the moon sort of turns this eerie reddish color because of the diffraction around the earth, right? That's beautiful. I don't know what we'll, we would learn from that. I could imagine that you might learn something about the earth's atmosphere because you get a very unique view of it, illuminated um, under very particular conditions and from a distance and so on. Um, so there, there is something, there's an awful lot that you can learn about um, very small particles when you have a very small angle of, um, of scattering. So this is maybe a complicated thing, but you again get sort of that serendipitous geometry through, through some of these events, which might be useful to look at some of the, I would say most likely to be an atmospheric thing, but not as an atmospheric scientist, I have no idea what we could learn, <laughs> but I would want to look at it for sure. All right, yes, I agree. Um, Richard asked, is it legal to own rocks from the moon? So that's an interesting question. Um, ownership is all just a, on the actual moon itself is actually something that we don't have an answer for. Um, you can own a meteorite that came from the moon and landed back on Earth. Um, and, and people go out and hunt for those in, in Antarctica all the time. Um, but actually owning the moon on the moon is a much harder thing to do. Um, some of the policy which has kind of cleared the way for us to use the resources on the moon, that's starting to come into place. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to make uh, your uh, return rocket propellant on the moon instead of having to bring it with you and then bring it on back, um, that has been you know, endorsed and we have a policy that says you could do that which is actually very good. I, I can understand that there are concerns about not wanting to sort of, you know, strip mine the moon, but it's actually an exceptionally small amount of resources that you need on the moon. And it's except, it's exponentially more efficient to bring them from the moon than have to bring, haul all of that mass out and land it, launch an extraordinarily heavy rocket, 
you know, each bit of additional mass that you want to bring with you costs even more um, additional propellant to launch it there. So it's incredibly inefficient to have to launch all of that from here to go to there. So if we wanted to be able to do that, there are some policies and some understandings that we want to be able to make the rocket fuel where we're going to use it. And that's a that's a really that's a very a much more efficient model to use. It's sort of like eating local, right? You want to use the resources from where you actually are. Um, and so we know how to do that generally, but the actual ownership of that is up and up in the air. I will say NASA did give a contract out for one dollar to buy. Um, to, to buy the first ever regolith from a private company. So there'll be someone who goes up there and scoops up a tiny little bit of regolith and moves it across the surface and delivers it to NASA for a dollar. And that is really just to prove that you could actually do that as a thing and test out that policy. It's sort of like the Supreme Court. Until we have the case that forces us to test it, we don't know if the policy we have is sufficient to answer the questions we that will come up in that in that process. So owning the moon on the moon is tricky. Um, owning the stuff or using the stuff derived from the moon, we kind of have an idea of owning the moon on Earth. You can do that. Any other questions? All right. My question, and, and maybe this could, could be the end, I don't know, but it was, um, it seemed like there was, we had the race to the moon, the moon shot, yeah. and we got there, we did the Apollo, and then did we think that we knew everything that we needed to know, and we just went off to other 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 projects, because now there's this, this new revitalization or new um, effort going back to the moon, because it seems like we still have so many questions that need sure. to be answered. Have we been working on all of these questions, or has there been, you know, a break, and now yes. we're back to it? Oh, that, that, that's, that's a great question. So, Apollo was very expensive, right? Um, there were intended to have a whole lot more of those, but the expense of it eventually became too much for us to bear. Um, and I'll say that, you know, even just being there for that brief period of time and with the, you know, however many few hundred hundreds of pounds that we brought back of, of samples, uh, it wasn't it wasn't nothing. We actually brought back quite a bit. Um, that allowed us to do just an absolutely shocking amount of science. Um, and I'll say that we've come up with phenomenal questions, advanced, basically, you know, kicked off planetary uh, science in a way that was, you know, previously just kind of speculation, right? So, so the, the importance of that is, is having, you know, you know, the actual source of the thing, you're there, you took the picture, you knew what had happened, it was, it was there, that is an extremely powerful thing. Um, and so I'd say that, yeah, Apollo happened and then it was too expensive to keep going back. And then we still had this like lag time for all of the exceptional science that we were able to do following Apollo. Um, and now when I think about what's the like flip on why we're going back, I think there's just more of an appreciation um, really just that we can, right? So after Apollo and all of that space stuff, we've had this um low earth orbit just become absolutely proliferated with satellites so we've we've learned how to launch satellites way way cheaper we've learned how to develop ones which can you know live in space for long periods of time and we've learned a lot about other things too and now now it's sort of like we're back to you know the apollo was the one time and now we realize we know a lot more about space we know a lot more about the moon about like the actual how to do it still lots of phenomenal science questions to answer that we're sort of mature enough as a space bearing species that we can do it in more than just the in and out kind of quick trip. And that's that's kind of the point that took some time for us to get to there. I, and that's where we're at. And we're still we're still testing it. Right. We're not we're not back there permanently yet, but we see it in a slightly different way now because we've matured in our you know science and exploration capabilities. Well, it's truly an exciting time for space exploration and learning more about our neighbor uh, that we look up to and we write songs about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that we see every night. Uh, but um, thank you. If there's any other question, oh, one more question. There's Alan, uh, radiation. Human, Human risks. risks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 
So, so certainly there are human risks. Um, and actually, you know, this brings me to another point that I didn't quite come up with yet, um, which is the idea of the moon as a proving grounds, right? So humans, the, the risk to humans for, for, um, uh, for space exploration is certainly radiation. That is that is a big part of it. Um, it's also just we don't really know how to be off of Earth for a very long period of time. We can go to the space station, but space station is like really, really close, right? You can get resupply, you can get all this other stuff. Um, on the moon is sort of our, our next shot to figure out how we can be off planet for a long period of time. Um, and that's going to be really necessary if we want to think about how we're going to go on to Mars. And the radiation is a, a, a very real problem um, to solve. In fact, one of the shocking things to me about how we would solve the radiation problem for Mars, you, you get exposed to radiation proportional to the amount of time that you spend out in space. So if you're out in space longer, you get more radiation. Kind of obvious, right? But the solution to like reducing that amount of time that it takes to go do a Mars mission and come back is to st uh, strap a nuclear rocket to your behind. So you, you strap a nuclear rocket on to avoid radiation. And I think that there's something kind of ironic about that. Um, but yeah, there, there's huge risks to human uh, humans uh, for the radiation that you'd have. There's some solutions for this. You can have just big chunks of material that can, um, that can uh, sort of just block and shield that radiation. Water, by the way, is a fantastic shield uh, for some types of radiation. Uh, but again, launching all of those from Earth would be prohibitively expensive. Um, but if we can make those structures in space, then we have a chance to um, to do it a much, much cheaper and at a much larger scale. Um, also, the really, really big, really heavy structures, you just might not be able to launch them inside of a, a rocket. They're so large. So you either have to assemble them from a, a bajillion launches that you're doing to put all this stuff together and bring all the radiation shielding and all that stuff, or you might be able to bring it from the moon, which has much lower gravity. So it's actually much easier to launch off of the moon than it is to launch off Earth. So there's that reason, too, that you can use the source materials from the places where it's easiest to use them, most efficient to use them. And that can also aid you to do yeah, radiation protection, get the rocket fuel that you need, um, make large scale structures that you could turn into a radio telescope like Arecibo. Uh, but on the moon, maybe in one of those craters, there's all sorts of really, really interesting things you can do if you have more capabilities that aren't just you that, that aren't having to be like launched from big explosions on earth so that that's kind of some of the ideas on on why we want to do this where we want to go how it benefits all of our exploration objectives and our understanding of ourselves well it like i said it's super exciting and we're going to be staying tuned i i think that i feel like we've had a behind the scenes look at what's going on uh, with the with Moon and Artemis and everything that has to go into it. And thank you so much for spending your evening with us, uh, Dr. Furman, and sharing your knowledge. And just for all of the work that you're doing um, to in this field and helping us uh, to get back to the Moon and, and, and learn more. And thank you all for joining us here this evening. Uh, I want you to Stay well, stay curious, and stay outside. Go look at the moon. Uh, it's coming in. <laughs> so we uh, look at the moon, and I know that I'm going to be looking at those craters completely differently um, after this presentation. Uh, it's been really uh, eye opening and awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.